if you do any prospecting with LinkedIn, you have got to go get set up with Surf. That's S U R F E. It's a tool you can use to add new contacts to your CRM system directly from LinkedIn in seconds. I'm using it every single day. I add contacts, follow my deals, keep track of notes, and it ends up saving me a bunch of time on prospecting and outreach, which means I can spend more time moving my deals along. The data is always 100% accurate since I don't have to copy and paste all the fields over from each and every contact that I want to put in my CRM. Instead, Surf does that all automatically with just one click in about 60 seconds. The team over at Surf has put together a very special offer for fans of sales players. There's a link down in the show notes and you can use the promo code JWSurf5. Don't forget the E at the end of Surf. That's JWSurf5 for 5% off your first year. Don't spend another minute doing things manually. Go get set up with Surf. All right, my guest today is Christian Banach. Christian is the principal and chief growth officer of Christian Banach LLC. That's his company he built to help other brands land six and seven figure sales opportunities through outsourced lead gen services. Now, Christian's super interesting because he spends all of his time thinking about outbounding, prospecting, and generating content that's gonna help build pipeline. And he's doing this on behalf of clients, so he has to succeed. So a few different directions this conversation took were around how you can write content that's relevant to your buyers and helps educate and nurture them before they ever get into your sales funnel. But I think my favorite part of the episode was closer to the very end when we get into a few things you can do to diagnose why your prospecting campaigns or your sequences aren't working. And Christian says it boils down to, to three different things typically. List, message, and offer. And I'm going to stop there because I want you to listen to the episode and hear Christian describe how you can go into each of those different areas and fix your outreach if that is potentially the problem with why you're not hitting your goals. So with that said, welcome Christian to the show. Christian, welcome to the SaaS Sales Players Podcast. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, Jesse, thanks for having me on. Uh, really excited for this conversation. And real quick, remind me, where where are you based in the U.S.? Or are you in the U.S.? I just assumed you were. Uh, I am. I am in the heart of America in Chicago. Ah, oh, great city. Great city. Um, awesome. So typically, you know, the way we kick the episodes off is my listeners always like to hear a little bit about how you got to where you are. Tell us how your career got started and any, you know, insights into your, your path to this point would be super interesting. Yeah, well, I would like to say that, uh, you know, I went to, to school specifically for this and it was a linear path and, and I got exactly where I wanted to go, but that was absolutely not the case. Uh, right. So for me, uh, and I'm sure like most listening here, I kind of stumbled into this, uh, into this field, uh, but my path actually started in high school um, where I at the time was going with friends to, you know, juice bars and, and dance parties and uh, decided at one point that I was going to uh, rent out a banquet hall and we were going to throw our own event. Uh, so we did. Uh, and it started off just booking local DJs and, uh, and, and inviting our friends out. And uh, it actually went over really, really well. We made it to money and decided then let's do another one of these events and this was ended up being the way that i paid my way through college is just kind of doing these uh these banquet hall and, and, and dance type parties with djs yeah. um but uh that ended up growing uh, i got out of college i decided to focus full time on this uh and what started off as banquet hall parties grew into a concert promotions business and we would go on to work with pitbull and t-pain lady gaga some really big artists wow. Um, and then what ended up happening a few years into that was we got approached by an experiential marketing agency and they needed some help with some promotions uh, for one of their corporate clients. And it, it was very similar to how we were promoting our concerts at the time, which was very much guerrilla in nature. We would be putting up posters yeah. and flyers on cars like this is right. before like the Internet really blew up. And uh, and we, the, the event went really well, the, the marketing event which led to another marketing event, which led to another agency finding out about us, which led to, uh, at the time, then us deciding, why are we working with these agencies? We can be directly working with brands. Uh, so essentially, the business that I had started uh, you know, at banquet halls grew into a concert promotions business and then morphed into an experiential marketing agency. And I, uh, things were buzzing along great. And then the 2008 recession happened. 
And unfortunately, business yeah. really dried up. And we were blessed to that point to be getting a lot of like inbound and referrals for all of our all of our new business. Um, I didn't really have a sales process. I never really studied sales, didn't know much about it. So I went yeah. out and I hired a sales consultant who came in and really taught, taught me the fundamentals of business development and sales. Uh, and I loved it uh, so much so that after about a year, I decided I'm going to close down my business. Uh, I was ready for a change and I was going to focus full time into new business. And that's what I did. So for the next 10 years, I uh, worked at various advertising and marketing agencies uh, and discovered my superpower really was top of funnel, um, hunting, prospecting, uh, which isn't yeah. always the sexiest part of the sales process. Everybody wants to be involved in the pitch and the close. Um, and while, you know, that's fun for me, I, I, I get a thrill of the chase. And, and that's really where the genesis then for, for what the business that I have now came from, which, you know, the, the pandemic can happen. And I started seeing agencies um, and other businesses going out of business and struggling. And I felt like it was deja vu to the 2008 recession, where mm -hmm. now I felt though, I was like that consultant that can go in and help others based on my experience. And yeah. I ended up quitting my job and forming the company that I have today, which is a business development and growth consulting firm. Uh, and we work primarily with advertising agencies and MarTech companies to help them with their growth. No, I love that. Thank you for for sharing uh, a bit about your background. So, and I, I totally agree that one of the most important parts of just business in general, not even just the you know tech business or the media business, is is pipeline and building pipeline, getting interest, rainmaking, if you will. I've heard it also called. And early on in my career, I really prided myself on being able to generate pipeline and get really good at the art of, of doing that. So it's kind of cool. You have a whole agency that's built around that ability to, you know, quote unquote, make it rain. Uh, what are some of the things uh, that, you know, especially recently in the last six months, you've found to be incredibly beneficial to your clients in terms of campaigns that work really well for generating pipeline interest and, you know, ultimately revenue, but starting with just generating that first uh, two-way conversation with a client. Yeah. Yeah. I think what it's exactly what you said is very important to point out is starting a conversation. Uh, I think uh, when we, when I really started getting involved heavily in this type of SDR, BDR type of work, uh, we were going right for the meeting right away. It was, Hey, do you have 15 minutes to, you know, get on your calendar? And, and, and that's exactly what we would, you know, our calls to action would be. Uh, but now it's really more about gauging interest um, and trying to start a dialogue back and forth with people. Uh, and, and so we've really kind of softened up a lot of our language um, to be more interest based. And beyond that, taking that a step further, that's just part of a, a bigger pie where, you know, we're really trying to be more about how are we going to add value to the prospect um, in our first engagement with them? You know, mm -hmm. we don't want to make it about us. Um, and about our features and our and all of that that we could do. It's more about trying to understand, hey, we've been looking into your business. Uh, you know, we think you might be experiencing this type of problem. And we've got an interesting perspective, a process or a tool or something that, um, you know, could potentially, you know, help that. And we're interested in getting to know you and, and, and we're trying to give them some value and some insights to first start the engagement, you know, off. And uh, that's definitely been a shift, you know, that I've seen, you know, it, I mean, this has started, you know, several years ago, but really over the last, you know, six months to your point, it's become more and more uh, necessary in order to cut through. That's what I've seen too. So when I, it's funny, when I started in this business, uh, in this, in the tech business about a decade ago, you could just send a lot of cold emails and eventually someone would respond and, and you could, I won't go as far as to say you could actually work your way back into your number and hit, you know, certain conversion goals and things like that. But as I've progressed in my career and as the industries have changed and as technology has changed and just the buyer itself has changed, uh, I'm finding it much harder to, you know, you know, you can no longer just load up a sequence with 5,000 email recipients. You shouldn't do that anyway, by the way, you're going to get blacklisted. Um, but you can't load up a couple thousand email prospects and expect some kind of meaningful conversion from that without, you know, what you're saying is creating a conversation, uh, you know, personalizing to some extent, and then coming into the interaction with value add immediately and not necessarily a, a hard call to action, but a, you know, an exchange of value in some form or fashion. So I think that's super interesting that that's, that's where the focus is. And I'm glad to hear that I'm not the only one experiencing that in, in the industry. And, and again, it's come a really long way. What are some other, yeah, what are some other things that you've seen over the last, let's just say since the beginning of 2022, what, what are some other 
uh, insights that you've gathered from best practices in terms of going to market and prospecting and outbounding and or inbounding, generating interest from awareness campaigns and things like that. I'd love to hear what you've seen as kind of the recent trends. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, to kind of build off of what we were talking about, the adding value in the 5,000 prospects, and you, you touched on this with the word personalization, uh, but that's another you know big key uh, for us is, is everything that we're renewing now is, is personalized. And we think about it in two buckets as hyper-personalized or personalized. Uh, you know, personalized might be, be a, you know, it might be sent to a certain industry, but if, in a buyer persona, but very targeted. Um, and then a more hyper-personalized approach may be actually, you know, taking an account-based approach where you're researching the individual company uh, and you're writing something very specific, you know, based on your research to that individual company. And again, we find that that's really necessary to cut through. Um, however, um, you know, what we're also seeing is that I think because others have started to jump on the trend of personalization that, yeah. you know, you really have to be relevant in your personalization. Um, I, I think, you know, a couple of years ago, you might be able to get by with, you know, Hey, I saw you went to so-and-so school. I love, you know, <laughs> the go Badgers. And, and that was personalization. Um, but now I, everybody's kind of on, onto that and we're seeing less and less results from that type of personalization. You really got to make it contextual to the offer, the value prop that you're, that you're sharing. So, so that's definitely one, you know, takeaway that, that we've been seeing and it's only accelerated recently. Yeah. That, that's so funny. You bring that up. Cause I remember probably about 2014, 2015, that was the go-to play was, Hey, you know, go, you know, go insert mascot from college and love your school. Saw you went to I don't know, university of Texas at Austin. Cool. Uh, and that just, it doesn't resonate anymore. It's not of interest. It doesn't add any value to the conversation, especially from a, you know, sales and marketing standpoint. So it's funny to hear, to, to go back in time and hear that. Cause that was totally the, 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 the playbook back in, you know, 2014, 2015, let's call it. Um, cool. No, this is super helpful. Now you guys do, do you guys do awareness campaigns as well as like outsource SDR work? Walk, walk us through some of the services that you guys provide to your clients. Yeah. So in terms of what we're producing for our clients is, you know, we're really responsible for uh, the actual outbound campaign. So we'll, uh, you know, we come in since most of our clients are not doing outbound previously already. Um, so mm -hmm. there's some education that needs to be done because it's, it is a different approach. So we're working with them on a strategic level to help peel back and understand what are those value propositions? Who are the right audiences? What are those offers we should be in front of uh, putting in front of them? We're writing the sequences, we're writing the messaging, and then we have our team that's then doing the outbound, you know, cold calling as well as uh, the emails uh, to schedule appointments between, you know, the decision maker and and then our client. So so that's what we're doing specifically for our clients. Now, uh, in, if we're talking about trends here a little bit, you know, now yeah. when we're talking about us, uh, when because we drink our own Kool Aid here, so just like right. you know we're doing for our clients, you know we're doing the same thing for ourselves. Um, however, what, what really has come to light for us over the last, you know, say six months and, and even more recently is, you know, we're having tremendous success for ourselves. And, you know, and but one of the reasons I think we're having uh, such success is because all the other activities that we're doing around and, and, and adjacent to our outbound campaign. So, uh, for example, you know, one of our most successful things that we've done is we've uh, created a, a weekly newsletter that actually comes out and we feed all of our prospects into this. It's a cold, you know, contact list. Um, but it's, again, it's, it's something that every Monday is delivered. I write a very personal wow. story um, in there. Uh, we share some insights um, in terms of different CMOs, chief marketing officers that have been hired, which is a value to our target audience. Mm. Uh, we provide other thought leadership content and every Monday, you know, at 11 AM, you know, that newsletter comes out. And there's no call to action to it. There's no, you know, ask, there's nothing salesy about it, um, but we yeah. feed all of our prospects into that list. And what ends up happening is that has really warmed up our, our, so now when we do go out and try to prospect, you know, cold uh, through an outbound email, uh, we are oftentimes getting people responding back. Oh my gosh, I love your guys' emails. You know, thanks for reaching out. Yeah. I'd love to, you know, sit down and talk more about what you guys do. Um, versus if we were not to have been sending out that monthly or that weekly newsletter, uh, you know, we wouldn't have those same, same type of responses. Yeah. So we're, we're seeing more and more like these other activities that need to be uh, implemented in order to warm up that cold list. 
uh, versus again, I don't know, like, you, you know, several years ago, I don't think it was as necessary, but I think you, you're, you're having to do all these other activities now. Um, you know, but if you're just going to go at cold, you know, it, it's going to be a little more challenging. All right. I got about a million questions now hearing about newsletters. This is something that's, that's really interesting to me because one, I'm a subscriber of a handful of newsletters, both sort of industry specific for my day-to-day -day selling role, but then also for some of the, uh, you know, side hustles and things like that, that I have going. Um, and just, you know, general curiosity, I'm, I'm interested in keeping up with several different industries. So uh, first question, this is maybe a little bit of a curveball, but do you think an individual contributor, seller, SDR uh, in, in tech could start up their own newsletter? And if so, you know, how hard would that be to get started? Walk us through maybe the process for getting that launched. And if, if you think that's a good idea for a very creative and, and you know, savvy rep to go out, an individual contributor to go out and create something like that as a way to generate and manage their own pipeline. The answer is yes, uh, cool. and I'm a great case study for it because that's exactly what I did before I even started my this business that I have here today. Um, I uh, created a, a newsletter, um, and we, obviously we have the contact data, and and I started sending out uh, emails to to these prospects, um, you know, that I had, and uh, and that's really where the beginning of my business actually started. Um, you know, I was working at a, at another firm, and I started sending out this this newsletter and warming up the audience. And started to see like, is there any traction? Are there anybody? You know, is anybody responding? What What do they lean into? What are they not interested in? Um, and and my the company I worked for was very supportive. You know, you know of of that. It was just another you know tool. Uh, but yeah. I think it was coming from me as a person. And and I use those learnings to apply to when I launch this business to use that same type of approach because. You know, most people don't want to get a newsletter from a corporation, but when there was a right. name attached to it, a, an individual, a person, it just seemed much more personal. And and the stories that I write are very personal. And you know what? Probably ninety eight percent of the people on the list don't care about what I have to say, but it doesn't matter to me because the two percent that do have leaned in and have become customers, and that's really all you need. You don't need a hundred percent. So. I absolutely think, yeah. you know, I mean, I, I've done it before and it's worked and I think, you know, others can do it as well. I think you just need to be uh, really thoughtful about the content that you put out um, and what you, and, and keep it, do not make it salesy, make it personal get, let them get to know you as an individual uh, and then be consistent, you know, with it as well, you know, having it once a month or every other third month or whenever you feel like it, you know, it's about that consistency and consistently right. showing up and adding value. When you started out, did you just sort of capture emails and contacts from your your sphere, your existing Rolodex, or did you have some sort of an opt-in page or some some way to capture you know subscribers to that newsletter? Yeah, so actually, I mean, it was it was really leads out of a database. Um, okay. was was a large way that I uh, that I had built or not built, but I you know created the list and started with the list. Eventually, it has morphed into you know using various sources, but um, but yeah, I mean, no different than you know going to zoom info and, and downloading, you know, some list and then sending out a cold email. Uh, it's the same premise, except you're, you know, using a automation tool to send it to, uh, to a mass list. That's super awesome. Um, how many hours a week do you spend prepping the, the, the newsletter to go out or is it pretty automated at this point? Um, the prepping is not the, is not the challenge, sure. you know, that, that takes 15 minutes to do. It's the creating the content, which takes time. Um, yeah. you know, the personal story that I write, which I also post on LinkedIn. So it's, it's the size of a LinkedIn post. So it's not very long, but yeah. it's a lot of thought that goes into it. So it could be two to three hours to write that post. Um, and then, you know, luckily now I have a team behind me. So they're doing some of the research also to put some of the other content together, uh, you know, but they're probably spending themselves a couple hours. So, I mean, it's evolved into this because now I have a full company that, that, you know, rely, you know, the newsletter has been such a key integral part of it, but in the yeah. beginning, it didn't start off this way. So I don't want to turn anybody off by their hearing, you know, oh, five, six hours of time, you know, it takes, you know, to do it. I, I think, you know, if you're willing to allocate an hour or two to start, I think that's, that's enough, uh, enough time to get things off the ground. And if you start seeing some success from it, you know, you, you'd obviously be willing to put some more hours behind it. Yeah, no, that's, that's fantastic. So the content creation and, you know, again, knowing that you now have a, a larger team and, and a company built around the newsletter, uh, assuming this would be for someone out there listening, who's just an individual rep who wants to start being more proactive about creating content. And, and by the way, for the listeners, 
you don't necessarily have to start it out as an email newsletter. This, to, to your point, could be a LinkedIn post. It could be a tweet. It could be, you know, some other social network that's wherever your buyers are. And that's going to vary depending on markets and, and, you know, your individual customer profile or ideal customer profile, I should say. So this could be whatever platform makes the most sense for your buyers. And in your case, it's email. And I think email is a really good one to start because most everybody checks their email every single day. And, you know, newsletters can be that, that nice, consistent surprise every, you know, Monday or Tuesday or one a month or whatever the cadence is. Um, as far as creating the content, do you are there? Do you kind of put together topics well in advance, or maybe the week ahead you go through and you think, "Hey, next week might be an interesting time to talk about X Y Z topic in the industry," or is it you know baked out for the whole year? You've got a whole plan, a content calendar, something along those lines. This is really interesting to me because. As a fellow content creator, I'm also trying to figure out how to reach more people through more mediums besides just podcasting or, you know, LinkedIn, right? So yeah, I'm really, very curious to hear your process there. Sure. Yeah. So so there's a couple of different pieces of content that, that we put out. So every week there is a, what I call Monday motivation. So it's me sharing a personal story that has some sort of a business lesson in it. Uh, and that I wish I would tell you that there was a content calendar behind it and, and a strategy. <laughs> it's usually me Sunday night, um, feeling, you know, th reflecting on my week, uh, what happened, what did I learn? What was a challenge? And then writing a little bit of a story behind it. Uh, and I've tried to write them in advance, but to be honest with you, like, I feel like you know, with me being under the gun, having to write it that night and whatever I feel inspired by, uh, I, I've found those end up working out better than the ones that are planned. So that's one piece of content. Now, the more educational type content that that's around, you know, the business and things that we do, we do have a, um, you know, more of a formal process behind that. That that type of content usually comes out on a on a monthly basis. Uh, so there there's a little bit more of a process and a calendar, yeah. and then we go and we write it, and and there's a more editorial process, and that will live in the newsletter. It also lives on our blog. It also gets repurposed then for our social channel. So we try to get a lot of mileage, you know, out of it. So it sort of depends uh, on the type of content, uh, you know, and and what format and and all of that and how it gets created. Yeah, this is this is great stuff. Uh, again, I think back to our earlier conversation, right? Lead gen, demand gen, building a pipeline in 2022 is so much different than it was in 2012. Uh, and so, and I think it does require writing and storytelling. And it sounds like you're able to capture, you know, stories on a weekly basis and, and put them into a medium that works for your buyer persona. I'm now curious, and I'm sure you're tracking this because this is, you know, this is your business, right? Um, do you have sort of attribution, you know, this, this many of our deals or clients came from the, the newsletter as their initial sort of source of, of finding us and, and, and engaging in our content or our brand. Do you have attribution, you know, metrics around that? Um, yeah, we do. Actually, I, I actually just went through this um, about <laughs> yeah. a week ago and, you know, I would say, so, so over the last 12 months, we brought on, I believe it was 20 clients um, and I would attribute directly from the newsletter where they responded to the newsletter and said, let's meet. And then they end up closing, uh, about wow. a third, uh, of our, of the 20 clients came from there. Now wow. of the other two thirds, uh, those were ones that, you know, might've connected with me on LinkedIn. Uh, those might be somebody that came off of an outbound email that we sent. Uh, but uh, so it's a little bit harder to say, but they were all on that newsletter as well. So, you know, I, I would say at least probably half of those would not have closed otherwise because they just they may not have chosen to respond to the email newsletter. But when I connected with them on LinkedIn, they remembered me from the newsletter and it started a conversation there. So I would say, you know, at least two thirds, you know, of our of our you know, closed one business was related to that newsletter. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I can imagine that's a great way, again, to just start a conversation. It's storytelling, and that's that's what prospects love. Uh, at least that's what I've found. The more stories that I infuse into my sales cycles, into my you know prospecting, that, that tends to get a better response regardless, right? Uh, or at the very least, it's the willingness to have a two-way conversation. Even if it's not a fit right now, it at least opens the door for a future conversation or uh, you know a future deal cycle. So Super cool. Thanks for, for going deep on that topic with us. Um, that again, and for me is, is relevant right now and very interesting. 
Uh, and I'm, I, it's something that I've thought about doing for a long time. In fact, I've thought about starting a second podcast that was geared towards the buyers for my, my role as a rep. Uh, that's a little bit harder to do because it means bringing on guests that are thought leaders in that space and trying to come up with, you know, audio content that, that works for that audience. And I've just haven't quite gotten there yet, but I'm wondering now out loud, if, if a newsletter might be a lower, lower hanging fruit opportunity there, uh, for me to, you know, put out some kind of consistent content. Now I want to go back really quickly to consistency. I can imagine that at some point you've had a Sunday night or a Monday morning where you just have not felt like writing something or there's writer's block or the coffee just hasn't kicked in right just yet. How do you push past, uh, you know, how do you push, push past that? Cause it sounds like you're very, you know, very, uh, organized and structured around that, that cadence that you have for the newsletter. What do you tell yourself if you're just like, I can't think about writing something right now. It's just impossible. Cause this is what I, this is what happens to me. Most Monday mornings is I sit down and try to write content or create audio content. And I hit this wall and I've got to go either drink more coffee or exercise or something to get the juices flowing. Walk us through, you know, your process for your fail safes for when you're just not feeling it. Yeah. Well, I, I, it happens quite often. Uh, There's, there's a number of different things that, that seem to kind of kick me into gear uh, you know, since it is a large portion of that newsletter is about the Monday motivation. So sometimes just scrolling through uh, quotes, uh, inspirational quotes might, you know, what resonates with me, what stands out with me, and then that sometimes will spark, you know, a story. Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, one of the other keys that that I've, you know, been doing is, you know, I'm, I'm really big on frameworks. And there is a writing framework called the Pixar formula. Uh, if you ever watch a Pixar uh, movie, they, they, yeah. every Pixar movie follows this formula, whether you realize it or not. And once you know the formula and then you think back at like Finding Dory and all these other movies, like they all follow the same formula. Right. Uh, and I've actually adopted, I would say most of my posts probably follow that formula. Um, and it's kind of fill in the blank. You know, it starts off once upon a time. So then I think about, okay, so where did this idea originate? Well, when I was 16 years old, I worked at this place, you know, and then the next portion, this happened. And and if you follow that formula, you can kind of just fill in the blanks from there with your story. And it gives you at least the structure to start. And then of course you want to go back and you want to edit and you want to turn it into your own. But I've it's sort of like Mad Libs, if you remember Mad yeah. Libs. Oh, yeah. um, so that's been really helpful for me to have. And I've since found a couple other formulas besides the Pixar formula that I that I like that, you know, I'll start to use some of those and see if like at least that idea that I had can start to take form. So that's been really helpful uh, for me is, is those types of formulas. Um, you know, this might sound goofy, but, you know, I'll go for a run um, and and put some yeah. music on. Mm-hmm. And, and next thing you know, like what thoughts are flying through my head, you know, while I'm running. Um, uh, meditation. I'm big on meditation. What's flowing in my head of meditation. So there's a lot of different things. And, 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 you know, I have a little bit of a list as well. So if an idea does spark um, in my head, uh, I'll try to write it down. And then if I do get that writer's block, I'll pull up that list. And sometimes that's helpful. So um, I don't want to say there's one magic bullet, but it's a combination of all of these that seems to help me. Yeah, that's, that's what I found also whenever I hit sort of a creative slump and that's, you know, not only in the podcast, but in my, in my selling role, working with a prospect, trying to solve a creative problem or something along those lines, usually like walking, running, or, or some sort of exercise. But um, I like your idea of reading inspirational quotes or, or reading something and sort of getting the, the ideas that way. That's awesome. Uh, I'm going to have to try to implement that in uh, or incorporate that in next time I hit that writer's block. Fantastic. So uh, tell us a little bit about... Um, you know, the, the, the work that you're doing, you mentioned that you, you, you take your own medicine, right? You're, you're using some of the same techniques and approaches, uh, that, you know, you ultimately help clients with to generate your own clients. One that really interests me and that I know will interest my audience is writing sequences, uh, you know, kind of in tandem to writing the, the, the newsletter, uh, it sounds like sequences as a service is, is something that you offer. And, most every rep out there has encountered a situation where they've got to sit down and write an email sequence or a a prospecting sequence. And again, it's the same challenge of how do I write something that's valuable? That's not annoying. That's someone's not going to mark as spam. Tell us about sort of the creative process behind, you know, going in, for example, with a client and researching their business and their value enough, and then being able to actually create a sequence that they can then use to, to target their clients. Yeah, absolutely. So 
So we go through a whole process with our clients and, and really, um, and we branded it, it's called Propel. Uh, but the first step is really understanding, you know, the pivotal problem that that client of ours is solving. And that's the first thing that we want to do uh, is, is, and we call it pivotal problem because for outbound, mm -hmm. we really want to focus in on problems that are urgent and important for the prospect to solve. Because if it's just kind of a nice to have type problem, or maybe incrementally would help the business, the odds of them stopping in their tracks and reading your cold email and responding is is slim. So really yeah. trying to understand what are the problems and, and our clients, a lot of them can solve multiple problems. Your tool, your SaaS product can probably solve multiple problems, but trying to zero in on something that's very urgent and important to solve right now and, 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 and getting very focused on one specific area. So that's really the first part. Before we're writing any emails or anything like that, we're trying to understand that problem. Mm -hmm. uh, that's step one. Then step two is understanding, all right, what is, um, what is our unique perspective on solving that problem? Uh, and, and layer and finding out, so here's the problem. And here are some three big ideas on how to solve that problem in particular. Uh, and we really try to be provocative and, in, in pulling out from our clients, you know, that, that perspective, that insight that they have, uh, and, and trying to zero in on things that are different also, because again, if, if it's going to sound like every other vendor out there, um, the odds of them stopping in a cold, you know, from your cold call and responding is, is very slim. So how do we, you know, demonstrate value and, and do so in a way that's provocative and different? So all of this is just initial work that we're doing with our clients. Uh, first and foremost, we're writing this all down. We're documenting it. We've created some templates and forms that we have our clients fill out, which is all helpful. Um, mm -hmm. But at some point then uh, we need to start writing. Uh, right. and, and once we have that information, it's, it's, it is helpful uh, to get things up and running. Uh, you know, and we've, you know, we continue to test and learn different things. Uh, you know, one of the great things about being a company like ours that's working with, you know, a, a couple dozen different clients is that, you know, we see what's working, uh, you know, kind of across different types of clients. Um, but we also see that there's certain industries, certain personas that, you know, there, there are differences, you know, with. So, um, I do caution anybody that's like, you know, especially nowadays, everybody's an expert, I feel like on LinkedIn on right. something, but that might be in their little world to their industry, to their buyer persona that might work. And it probably does, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for yours. So, um, yeah. you know, I, I encourage everybody to test and learn things, but, you know, to get more, to get back to your question about writing the sequence, then, you know, we really, you know, the first two emails are usually about, you know, we, we like to start our emails about really what is the problem, you know, it, and, and we like to frame it in terms of like what's happening kind of more of at a macro level and then what's happening more at a micro level. And then, you know, from there, we'll, we'll write something about what our solution is or what our offer happens to be and share that provocative, you know, point of view on it. And then we have our call to action. Um, and then to start yeah. everything off before even that, you know, we do some, you know, we'll do some personalization on top of that. So that's usually how we start. The first email is very personalized then based on, you know, an observation that we had. Here's the problem. Here's the solution. Here's the call to action. The second email will usually expand upon, uh, you know, what whatever that solution happens to be. Uh, the third email, you know, we we still implement uh, a, like a bump type email. I know there's a lot out there that people that say, yeah. you know what, you can all, you have to add value in every single email. I don't know if that's always the case. Sometimes you know, executives are just busy and, and something just short that bubbles it up to the top of their inbox, I still think works. And then the fourth email that we've been doing um, lately, a lot of our sequences are about four, four emails long right now. The fourth email is a lot of that typically has been, you know, we'll figure out whatever the best piece of content is, whether that be a case study or a video or whatever it happens to be. And yeah. we'll just share that uh, that link um, and no call to action, really. It's, it's really light saying something like, you know, um, we understand you're busy. We haven't heard from you. You know, take a look at this on your own time. If it sparks an interest, reach out. Um, and, and we've had some good responses, you know, from from that approach as well. So we've been doing a lot of like four email sequences. Uh, and then we, we, we do calling as well. All of our clients we're, we're calling, uh, in between, uh, you know, we've found some personas, uh, phone has been very valuable to us and we're setting at least half the meetings from phone. 
we've found yeah. other uh, personas of ours where, you know, we're reaching them, you know, it takes a hundred or 200 dials just to get one person on the phone. So we've pulled mm -hmm. back on some of the calling for some of those personas, but initially yeah. out of the gates, we're always, you know, testing and learning because phone we think is, could still be very valuable. So I would say on average, though, most of our sequences are probably about, you know, eight or nine steps, four emails and about four or five phone calls. This is uh, this is validating my approach because I've had a couple of counterparts and, and colleagues over the years that have, have looked at my sequences. I, I've always prided myself on having like an eight step sequence, uh, and that's probably maybe four, five emails at most, and then you know the equivalent, roughly the equivalent in calls. And then I sometimes infuse in things like a LinkedIn in mail or follow someone on LinkedIn or save their their profile as a lead in Sales Navigator or something along those lines. In some personas that I've sold to, particularly more on the technical dev side, I'll follow them on Twitter because that's a, a popular medium for, you know, more technical, uh, for whatever reason, there's more, uh, you know, CTOs on, on Twitter. I, I think I kind of know why, but there's more CTOs on Twitter than on LinkedIn, I'd say, or they're more active on Twitter than LinkedIn uh, versus if you're selling to marketing or sales, you're probably more, uh, you know, more likely to engage them on LinkedIn than on Twitter. So I'll incorporate usually like a social step in there, uh, you know, one or two social steps couple of calls and then a couple of emails. And usually it rounds out to about eight to 10 steps, but I've had a couple of colleagues and managers and leaders in the past say, it's not long enough. You got to do an 18 step sequence uh, that spans an entire month. And, and in my, in my mind, it's kind of the same as why you wouldn't necessarily want to write your weekly newsletter six months in advance because business changes so much so quickly, feelings and impressions change all the time and stories change and new things develop and, and nobody wants to read content that was writ written six months ago. And, and in a sequence, nobody wants an email that was crafted, you know, a month ago, you want to try to get new and relevant information. I also totally agree with your take on the bump emails. I'm, I'm not sure who out there is saying you have to add value in every email. That seems ridiculous because I think you're exactly right. In fact, uh, a lot of times, and I don't remember, I think it was John Barrows who said this, that you should always send your first email twice because more than likely the first time that prospecting email goes out, the odds of it actually being read the first time are very close to zero. And so you can send the exact same email this a second time, maybe a week later or three days or five days later, whatever you're you know most comfortable with. And then I totally agree with you that there, there should be a good number of the emails, at least one that's, hey, want to make sure you saw this or bumping this up to the top of your inbox, realize you're busy. And then I'm also a big fan of the final email being not a, not a hard breakup email, but more of a set the expectation, which could take, take the shape of something like, is this interesting to you? Or is this an active project right now? Or am I wasting my time reaching out to you? Or I don't want to waste, you know, mutual time uh, with repeated follow-ups. Any signal you can send would be helpful. That way, I at least know. And I can continue to nurture that lead in whatever way I need to. And in your case, that's probably put them, you know, make sure they're subscribed to the newsletter and continue to nurture them over the course of every week with light content that doesn't have a hard ask uh, at the end of it. It's just informational, uh, you know, helpful, valuable content for them. So that, I think that's that's really great. This is super valuable uh, for for my listeners because again, a lot of them their their day to day job is writing sequences, uh, writing, you know, emails that are going to get the attention of their buyers. And that buyer could be a senior level executive at a big, big box retailer. It could be a, you know, chief tech, uh, chief technology officer at a up and coming Silicon Valley tech company. Right. And so trying to, you know, create content for those people, especially if you've never been in one of those roles. And that's been one of my biggest struggles being a seller is how am I supposed to resonate with a CTO in Silicon Valley when I've never been, you know, a technical leader in Silicon Valley, how am I supposed to write content that resonates with that person? Maybe walk us through how you go about, especially because you're doing it on behalf of clients too. And I'm sure, you know, across your 20 plus clients, there's a lot of nuance and variance in that. How do you guys go and research the, the, the buyer personas and what, you know, you mentioned the, the initial, you called it a pivotal, was it a pivotal pain point or a pivotal, pivotal problem? Pivotal problem. How do you uncover that? at scale across, you know, as many clients as you have. And, and again, most of my listeners are just trying to think, all right, we sell X widget, you know, to Y buyer. How do I find that pivotal problem? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, that's a great, a uh, great point. And, you know, some of our clients come to us and they do have it pretty well defined. Um, but I would say that's, 
that's not the norm because uh, they they haven't done outbound already or they never really thought about it this way. So we're very oftentimes you know tasked with helping them come up with what what the pivotal problem is. Um, so you know so part of that is really doing an audit of the work that they've done already um, and and trying to understand are there some commonalities on and with those problems that they solve. Um, but when we're thinking about you know, it more on a broader level, you know, once we have some baseline uh, information, uh, it's, you know, Google, uh, a lot of it is just turning to Google and, 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 and trying to understand the industry um, that you're targeting and looking up, I mean, it, it sounds simple, but you know, if you're selling into consumer packaged goods companies, consumer packaged goods companies, pain points, marketing pain points, or mm -hmm. technology pain points, and there, there's so much wealth of information that is out there that, you know, you can, uh, you can start to find it, you know, just simply through Google. Like, you know, we we do have some fancy tools that we use as well. But to be honest with you, we're probably using Google more than we are using some of these expensive fancy tools. Um, so I think everybody has access to it. Uh, you know, there are, you know, especially, you know, for us, it's a little bit harder because we can't dedicate ourselves fully to just one client. We have a lot of clients, but if I was an individual contributor, I mean, there's just so much content that's out there that you can learn about the different industries. There's podcasts, there's videos, there's webinars, there's books, you know, you got to just immerse yourself, you know, into that business. And whether you've been in that role or not, you know, you, you can pretty easily start to walk away with what some of those pain points are and, and, mm -hmm. and what are the topics, uh, you know, look up some of your prospects. Are they speaking at conferences? You know, what are the topics that they're speaking about at those conferences? You know, what are they posting about on social media? Uh, you know, join communities on LinkedIn and other and Facebook. And what are what are some of the conversations happening around there? You know, you can kind of be a fly on the wall, um, you know, and really start to absorb that. And 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 I think that's you know that's what we do uh, here. Um, and and I think anybody really could could do that as well. So thank you for the transparency that that Google is is really you know the handiest of tools in, in terms of trying to go and get to the bottom of the, those pain points. I think a lot of people want to overcomplicate that. They want to say, well, I got to go get to this conference in Vegas or uh, you know read this book on the topic or whatever it is. And I think you're exactly right that there really is so much information out there that's completely free, and it does take a little bit of groundwork to try to uncover that. But you know, is starting out by just googling. You know, what what does my what does my buyer care about? And and you know, insert your buyer. Maybe your buyer is a CTO. Maybe it's a director of customer experience or director of marketing or sales. You know, starting out with some of those things. And of course, most most tech companies have uh, you know a slide or something dedicated to who your buyer personas are and what they care about. But if if you're at a startup or something that doesn't have that, uh, or at a company that sounds like was is within your client profile that maybe has never focused on the outbound targeting, then, you know, it sounds like Google's maybe the best place to just get started and get some idea of what the day-to-day the -day challenges are in that role. And then of course, working backwards and figuring out how your technology helps solve some of those problems. So that's, that's super helpful to hear and understand. Yeah. 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 We don't need to overcomplicate things. Uh, there's, there's so much out there, you know, already, and, and it's, and it's going to be testing and learning, uh, you know, and depending on your role, like if you're handling the calls themselves, uh, you know, you're going to hear directly from uh, the prospects, but that's, that's probably going to be the, the best resource. You know, you can kind of take your best stab at what you can find on Google, but you know, either once you start booking these calls, or if you're not handling those calls and an AE is, Talk to the AE, sit in on some of those calls, and this this way you can actually hear specifically from the prospect, uh, you know, what inspired them to take the call, what are some of the challenges that they're hearing. So yeah. you know, you, and everybody has access to this. Yeah. So I imagine, I imagine that in your world, you have a relatively short runway to prove results to your clients, uh, and perhaps there's a guarantee. You can share that on the air if you want. Don't feel like you have to, but I imagine there's some sort of guarantee when I'm a client and I'm signing up for your services. There's some kind of an SLA that you know by this time I'll start to to get you know meetings and at bats. What do you do when something's not working and you've got to quickly iterate and figure out? what can work so you can deliver that result to the client. I think this will be really interesting for my listeners because, you know, sometimes we just keep still doing the thing that doesn't work because we're too uncomfortable to pivot really quickly. And again, I imagine in your world, that's life or death, right? You've got to quickly pivot if something's not working and change messaging, change cadence, change buyer persona, whatever that is, or, or you know, rethink the, the pivotal problem. 
walk us through the process of, of transitioning or, or pivoting quickly and, you know, maybe give us some of the, the stakes, you know, what are the stakes here? Uh, it, it, what happens when you're not able to deliver quickly to a client? How do you resolve that? I know that was a lot of questions packed into one, but I'm genuinely curious. Yeah, no, uh, great question. And, and I think, you know, what, you know, when I was in, in roles before, sometimes we would just have this enormous list and we would just keep hammering it. And, you know, you, nobody really knew how many emails you were sending per month or who you were sending them to or what was working or not. Uh, so when I built this company, you know, we did so kind of taking a page out of the software development book uh, where we do everything in monthly sprints. So right, right now we're in the middle of, of a sprint for a client. And, you know, so we'll do all the research. We'll come up with the pivotal problem. We'll have the audience. We'll have the buyer persona. We'll have the offer. We'll write the sequence. We'll write the mess. We'll do everything that we've been talking about here today to a set number of prospects in that 30-day sprint. And then while we're doing it, we're obviously keeping track of open rates and click rates and yeah. response rates and connection rates on the phone. And when we get to the end of that 30-day sprint, you know, we look and see what the results were, you know, and we keep benchmarks of, you know, what is, what is good, what is not so good. And then every 30 days though, we're reevaluating um, all the different levers that we can pull. Do, you know, do we think this pivotal problem after we've had some conversations with, with folks, do we think that that's really a problem or, or not? Yeah. Do we need to change that? Is something off with our buyer persona or the industries that we're targeting um, uh, or the com types of companies? Is something off with our offer? Is the message not resonating? So there's a lot of different levers that you can, you know, look and pull. In my experience, it's usually been the list, it's been the message or the offer. Those are probably the three that we look at, you know, first and foremost. And it's usually one of those is, is what we try to tweak. Um, but I think the biggest key is is that, you know, that that I think we do well here is that we have those 30-day sprints. So it's yeah. not like we're we're gonna get too far, you know, down and it's gonna be six months later, we're all gonna be scratching our heads, oh, this isn't working. You know, we're within 30 days, mm -hmm. you know, we're already taking a temperature check and making some tweaks, you know, along the way. So, um, so I would definitely advise, you know, sellers to think about these in, you know, I don't know what the right, you know, seek, uh, time period is for you. Maybe it's right. 30 days, maybe it's two weeks. Um, I don't think it should be longer than 30 days though. Um, and, and can, can just keep track of those numbers and, and, and be able to compare and contrast. That's what's key because what might be working even for us with one of our clients, what, a, what a good open rate is for another client may not be the same. So, you know, you have some sort of benchmark, but you have to have flexibility to know that what you really want to do is just improve month over month from whatever you were at before. And after a few months of improvement, you're going to, you're going to get to where you need to be. I like that. Yeah. You're, you've got a set amount of time and it doesn't, it's not too short. It's not like you're trying something out for three days and you're, you're pulling your hair out saying it's not working yet and pivoting in, in you know, in less than a week, it's a nice, you know, 30 days of data to, to go by not longer than that, because then, then you're being, I think a little too passive and you're not, you know, making those tweaks or changes. I want to go back to something you said, you said, typically the problem boils down to the list, the message or the offer. Let's say I'm a, a sales rep or an SDR at a software company. And I want to just do a quick analysis on those three things, those three levers, let's call them. Um, list, I'm, I'm guessing it's, you know, just bad quality data. Maybe the leads aren't, aren't, you know, active or, or they're there. It's a stale list where maybe someone's there's a lot of churn or people have moved on and you get a bunch of bounced emails. Is that, is that a fair assumption? Uh, that's part of it. Certainly okay. if, if you got bad data, that could be part of it, but it could be the wrong persona uh, okay. that you're, that you're going into. Uh, you know, I know in some roles, you know, you don't have the ability to, to select, you know, who you're targeting, uh, but right. in others you do, but I think it's something that you should be aware of and, and paying attention to is that, uh, are you getting a lot of, you know, responses back from prospects that, you know, this, this isn't my department or this isn't for me, you know, well, you might have a, a persona problem on who you're targeting. Uh, it could be the types of companies that you're reaching out to, you know, maybe you're reaching out to, you know, small companies and, and they don't need your service, but the big ones do or vice versa. So it could be the companies, it could be the industry, you know, so there's a lot of different factors on, on the list portion of it um, uh, beyond just, you know, whether the emails are getting delivered or not. Okay, cool. So anyone out there listening, if you're checking your list, you know, some of those factors are, are worth probing and testing, you know, is it the right buyer persona? Is the list, you know, clean? Is it, you know, the right type of company? Then you said messaging. So I'm imagining just thinking out loud here, messaging is probably, is the, is there a hook? Does it, is it interesting? Does it speak to a specific problem? Is there any value exchange? What else am I missing on what, you know, what could be a possible troubleshooting for, for messaging? 
Yeah, you know, usually with messaging, uh, you know, we all we say we call it the 40 40 20 rule 40% of your success in outbound will be from your list 40% will be from your offer and 20 from your message. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of people focus maybe too much on the message. Um, but it's still important. Obviously, it's still part of the three the three lovers. But when we think about messaging, uh, a lot of times it boils down to, you know, is this easy enough for my grandma to understand? I know it sounds silly, uh, but especially when we're talking more technical, we get yeah. all caught up in the jargon and the features and the, all of this. And at the end of the day, if you're not in that business and living and breathing it, uh, and you were to read this email, would you actually understand what it happens to be? And I think sometimes we get fooled because we're targeting you know, C-suite executives at these big companies and they make all this money and they're smart people. But at the end of the day, they're just people, right? They're reading this probably on their phone between meetings. Like they don't want jargon free. There's a lot of research out there. And this has been confirmed, you know, on our side that, you know, emails that are written somewhere in that three grade level three to eighth grade level actually perform better than something that's yeah. written at a, at a, you know, college or, or high school level. Um, you know, you just got, and I think that has changed back to our earlier conversation, what has changed over time. Uh, I think emails used to be much more formal, uh, you know, cold emails. Now it's very yeah. informal. It's almost like a text message or a tweet, you know, type mm -hmm. of casual, uh, but that's how people are using email and communicating. So um, that's usually one of the first things that we're looking at is, you know, is this just too complicated, you know, is, for somebody to understand? Is it really crystal clear? And, and I do recommend everybody uh, you know, find a, a partner, you know, outside of your organization uh, that may be in, in a sales role and share messaging with them. Ask them, hey, give me some feedback, you know, on this message. Let me know what you think about it. Uh, and I say outside your organization because inside they're probably going to know all your jargon, you know, that, that you're using. Right. Uh, but outside, they're probably not going to know it as well. So they could provide a little bit of a different, you know, perspective. Uh, on it. So that's one of the, probably the first things that we look at is, um, you know, is, is this casual? Is this short? Is this, you know, jargon free? Um, and, and, and that's, again, that, that's one of the biggest lovers from a messaging standpoint. So then offer, and this is something I haven't talked about enough on the show. And I don't think enough sellers, individual contributor sellers think about the offer enough. I've only even scratched the surface of it because I've read a couple of books specifically on marketing and not on selling. But I, 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 you, when you, when you broke down the, the numbers, you said, what is it? 40% is actually more tied to the offer. So uh, of those three things we just talked about, you know, list message offer is actually probably the most important one anyway. And I think there's a lot of sellers out there, you know, especially the ones who are early on in their career, ones who haven't been exposed to some of the, you know, first principles of marketing that probably scratch their head and they're like, well, I don't know what an offer, it doesn't matter. I, who cares about the offer? I'm just trying to set a meeting, right? And their offer is actually non-existent because they're too busy focused on when can I get 15 minutes of your time to show you our cool widget, right? Um, talk to us a little about some of the troubleshooting things or, or you know, some diagnostics we can do if, if you don't think the offer is aligned uh, or interesting enough to compel a prospect to bite. Yeah, so I think just about almost anything can be reframed, you know, as an offer, every, every message, you know, it, it's really starts off first and foremost about, again, looking at it through the lens of adding some sort of value and making it less about yourself. So, uh, so what we've advised our clients, you know, and I know in, in some of these individual contributor roles, you know, you may not have this liberty, but it's something that you should think about talking to your, you know, your, your team about, uh, you know, we've actually gone away from asking for 15 minutes. You know, most of the appointments that we're booking are one hour and people kind of shake their head like, wow, like, you know, how are you able to book a one hour meeting? And the, 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 the difference here is that because we're not asking for a meeting so we can, you know, tell you how many awards we've won and, you know, how great we are and, and, and where our office is located and how many employees we have. Like, it's not about us. It's about us providing you with some sort of value, some sort of, we call it insights meetings is what we're trying to book for our, our clients. So again, it's really understanding and trying to get to the core of like, uh, uh, we, there's a problem that we think you're having and, and we have an interesting solution um, on how to solve that problem. And it's based on work that we've done with this client and that client and that client. And we think you might be interesting in these insights. So it's really about you know sharing those insights and, and we've found greater success doing a one hour insights, you know, thought leadership, you know, if you will, uh, sharing of knowledge and knowledge exchange, then we have a quick 15 minute call, which seems, you know, 
odd, maybe to some, um, well, it's only right. 15 minutes. Why wouldn't they give me fit? But there's nothing in that 15 minutes for them. They would rather allocate an hour and get something out of it than 15 minutes and get nothing out of it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I really, you know, challenge everybody to, to think about, you know, and, and look at like, what is your, you know, your company's and they may not have articulated this, but what is their unique right, point right. of view and their thought leadership, something proprietary, something different and unique that can solve a problem. And you want to just get on, you know, get on their calendar to share some of those insights with them and, and, and don't be so attached to the outcome of that call. Um, you're just going to share that information with them. If, if there is, if they, if it resonates with them, then great, then let's continue the conversation. If it doesn't, then you got to be willing to walk away understanding that, you know, yes, I shared some information with them, but that's, um, and that's may that may be only uh, the only place that it goes. Well, Christian, that th the last few minutes, especially the solid gold for anyone out there who's pounding the pavement, prospecting, trying to generate pipeline for themselves. Uh, because I think a lot of times we keep doing the same thing as, as sellers and we just don't really know how to diagnose what's not working and just providing those three different levers or those three different options for, for testing, I think does simplify it and, and gives hopefully everyone listening a starting point. If you're out there writing sequences, writing emails, making phone calls, try to figure out if it's the list, the message, or the offer that, that might be off. Uh, incredibly valuable stuff. Uh, before we wrap up here, how can my listeners get in touch with you and your company if they're interested in learning more about your services? Yeah, absolutely. So um, you can go to my our website, christianbanach.com. Uh, you can learn all about us there. Uh, our blog is there. You can sign up to the newsletter that I mentioned uh, there. Uh, I'm also very active on LinkedIn, uh, you know, and, and getting even more active, sharing some of the tips and things like that, that, that we're learning, uh, you know, across all of our clients. So you could find me, uh, Christian Banach on LinkedIn and, and add me there. And uh, always, you know, open to having conversations. I'm always a lifelong learner. I love to learn from others. So um, we love to hear some feedback uh, on this conversation and what's working for some of your listeners. If anybody wants to drop me a message. Fantastic. Well, Christian, thanks so much for coming on the show. Any uh, final words of wisdom you care to share with the listeners? Uh, I think, you know, the, one of the biggest things that I'll say is just keep, keep at it, you know, have tenacity, have grit, uh, you know, just because somebody has not gotten back to you doesn't mean they're not interested. Um, I unfortunately see too many people just kind of giving up after one email that they didn't hear back from a prospect. So just keep at it uh, and you keep doing the right things. Uh, eventually everything will work, work out for you. Great stuff, man. Thanks again for coming on. Thank you, Jesse. 